joined the Navy from Lander. Um, went to Hospital Corps School. <laughs> Did all my sea duty uh, in the country of Vietnam. 1968 with uh, Echo Battery, 2nd Battalion, 11 Marines, taking care of Marines. Um, five days in country, we received uh, mortar rounds at headquarters. Um, went with the battery uh, the 30th of January, 68, uh, 31st of January. Took about seven rockets in the compound, and that started Teta 68. We were at Fubai. Um, then I went to just outside of Way City, and uh, we shot fire support for the Marines, river boats, anybody that needed it. And then we started working our way back down south um, towards Da Nang. Um, I went to Fulock 6 and then Fulock. Um, went out on uh, Operation Sussex Bay. They stuck us out in the middle of a rice paddy and uh, Typhoon Mary hit. Uh, for three days we were standing in water um, before the typhoon let up. Um, they thought we were going to have to walk out, but they it finally let up, and they picked up our 105s and all of us, and our ammunition was pretty well run, at least the powder, uh, disposed of it, and then ended up uh, down in Anwa, um, went out on uh, my last operation. Uh, in uh, Arizona Territory. Um, the Marines took very good care of me. I'd like to think I took very good care of them. Um, come back home in uh, December 12th of 68. Um, we landed in uh, Travis Air Force Base and then they took us to San Francisco International where all the hippies and stuff did their thing. Um, then I went to China Lake, California for 18 months and got out of the Navy and went to x-ray school. So that's about it. What, what were your initial thoughts, sir? Um, when you when you first got in the few days, sir, what were your initial thoughts? <laughs> when we landed in Tonsonut, um, it was a commercial aircraft, and all the soldiers were outside, and as soon as they opened the door, why? The first thing you heard was, Merry and Christmas, uh, we're going home. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, that was, uh, I don't know, it was I mean, it wasn't expected, but, you know, at the end of my tour, I sort of felt the same way. Um, it was just, you know, the guys were really relieving a little steam, and they were going home, back to the world, and we were in a war zone, so. What made you decide to come to this, uh, this event, sir? Um, that was a tough decision. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm very proud of my service. I think the Marine Corps is the greatest 
bunch of guys in the world. And I just thought, I guess I needed to see what it was like. So, from 68 to now is a long time. say to a veteran who might be considering you know coming out to an event like this but is maybe maybe a little hesitant or something sir actually I tried to get several veterans that I know to come down uh, they didn't do it I I just think that it's uh, uh, really rewarding and uh, very emotional. <laughs> How do you feel that the state has done with this particular one? I'm not sure if you've went to any other um, gatherings or reunions or anything like that. I have so not. How, how do you feel that the state has done with this one? Sir? The state did a wonderful job. I'd like to thank all the people that did it. Uh, you know, uh, war is hell and uh, to be spit on. <laughs> Called names. Have things thrown at you. When you did what your country asked you to do, it just ain't right. So, you know, I think that uh, we have a lot of Vietnam veterans that are homeless and, and alcoholics and, and drug addicts because of the way we were treated when we come home. Uh, I know we saw a lot of crap, some more than others, um, but when you're not wanted, why? It makes it worse. And I was in the medical field for 45 years went to x-ray school after I got out of the Navy and got to see a lot of veterans. Had the dubious pleasure of meeting one of the nurses at a hospital I worked with that when she found out I was a Vietnam vet said, well, I protested that war and I lost it. Um, it's a good thing the lady was a rent a nurse because whenever I got called in she made sure she disappeared so um, probably wasn't nice on my part but oh well I don't think it was good what they did either so is there is there something that you uh, you might say to someone who might still be in one of those dark spots or you know like you said especially the treatment, I, has to affect someone, you know, into maybe a situation that they might be in now. Is there something that, you know, you might say to that, that veteran? Um, talk to somebody, uh, call the VA, uh, Find a friend. I don't. I don't. You know. It, it, it's, it's. It's just. It's hard to do. I, um, when I left Vietnam, um, we flew to Okinawa. When we first boarded the plane in, at Tonsonut, they uh, got us all set down on there, and it was a commercial aircraft, and. Then they made us all get off because they had a flat tire. And when we finally did get off the ground, there was mortars hitting the end of the runway. And we got to Okinawa about 5 o'clock in the morning. They didn't let us go get a nap or anything. They just took us to chow hall. And then they started all of the going through your shots and everything you needed to do and then we were supposed to go on liberty and they canceled that and said no you're going to go home in the morning so 
got to spend the, the, the entire night getting your uniforms made because uh, none of us had anything other than the clothes we were wearing when we were in Nam. And six o'clock next morning, they took us to the airport. Um, and there was a, a whole plane full plus of, of men sitting there that we figured would fly out before we did. And, <laughs> and they actually put us on the plane first, and I'm glad they didn't have guns because they, they weren't very happy. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's the way the way it ended. So. How do you feel about the decompression time that you got, sir? So I know that, like you said, you had 24 hours to get everything in order. How do you feel that decompression time might may or may not have affected coming directly back into the United States, sir? So do you? Do you feel like that was enough time or an adequate amount of time to to get your mind ready to be I, back, sir? I don't I don't know because I didn't have that luxury or you know, it, it wasn't meant to be and, and and of course everybody wanted to get back to the real world, um, not knowing what was waiting for us, but you know, we all wanted to get back home, so um I mean, you just you 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 dig down deep and and you just do what you got to do. You know, when I was in China Lake, California, we'd muster out at seven o'clock in the morning, and dang fighter pilots would come over and break the sound barrier. And being the only combat corpsman there, I'd hit the ground, and everybody'd laugh, and I'd laugh and dust myself off, and. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, it's just Fourth of July hits, and somebody lights a string of firecrackers, and you know, you're out of bed and scaring the hell out of your wife and your kid, and uh, just you know, you just learn to deal with it. You know, I mean, it's just I don't know. Um, I just don't. I, I, I'll believe to the day I die that that had we been treated properly when we come home, we wouldn't have so many veterans, uh, Vietnam veterans that are uh, homeless and alcoholics or drug addicts. And I remember one story a veteran told me when I was doing an exam on him that he got home and slept in one morning. He got when he got up. His dad said, "Why are you going to get a job now or what?" And uh, so he packed his bags and left. And he'd never been home since. So, and that was that was uh, well. I got laid off the end of 2010. So sometime before that. So and that that's just that's just typical of of Vietnam veterans, so. So many folks today don't serve. What, what's your perspective on, on the generation that, that doesn't give to their country? Um, I, I, and the reason I ask is I just heard Mr. Galloway talking about that just a little bit ago, that, that he believes everyone should, should serve somehow, whether it's Peace Corps or Teacher Corps or in the service. I agree with that too, and, and I think Part of the reason, that, that, and this, this is only my opinion, but part of that comes from Nixon pardoning the draft dodgers and letting them back in this country free uh, so he could get reelected. And now all of those people are the ones that are teaching our kids and at the colleges and in the ivory towers that they call. And they're not teaching them what our generation was taught, you know, that, that uh, it's the right thing to do to, to stand up and fight for freedom. And, and I, don't, I don't think the, the, that they're being taught the Constitution the way we were. I think that 
they need to be taught that and, and they really need to know that freedom isn't free. Um, and, you know, as long as, as long as we have that mentality of people in the Congress and in our schools and, and the higher learning institutions and right up to the President of the United States uh, that doesn't know anything about working, let alone about freedom, uh, that, that's the way it's, it, 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 that's why it's the way it is. And I talked to a psychologist one time doing an exam on him and he worked with kids and we got to talking about all of the metal in the kids' face and all, all over and he said, I just don't understand why they do that. And I said, well, I can tell you why they do it. I said, they didn't get spanked when they were kids, so they inflicted the pain upon themselves by putting all of this earrings and nose rings and whatever in. And he kind of started laughing and he said, can I use that? I said, yeah, if it'll help a kid, you damn right you can use it. So, you know, uh, and I, you know, Dr. Spock come along when, when we were out of Vietnam and, you know, you can't spank kids, you can't discipline them and, and the world's going to hell in a handbasket because of it. Now, if, um, there's a teenager that might somehow understand what happened today with the parade and this weekend with the welcome home. What, what do you hope they're thinking? What do I hope? They're thinking. Well, I'm, I, I would hope that, uh, that they would be thinking that maybe freedom is worth fighting for and, and maybe doing a little service to the country. You know, the, the biggest thing that, that's not promoted by the military or the schools or anybody is what kind of an education you get when you serve in, a, and, and I don't care what branch of the service you and I'm a little partial to the Navy and the Marine Corps, but um, you know, you, you can get into schools and you can get a trade. I mean, I was a hospital corpsman, uh, went into the field of x-ray. Uh, uh, there wasn't anything that I couldn't and didn't do in x-ray. Um, and it, it was all because of the, the training that I got in the Navy. So. You know, and, and uh, there's another thing, being in the field of radiology, there's two things that, that were developed for radiology that come directly from the military. If, if you ever watch any World War II movies, um, you, you'll notice that their radar just goes 180 degrees and they have two of them and they're pointed in different directions. Well when they come up with the slip ring technology so that the radar could be one screen going around and around, then they took CT, which was computerized axial tomography, and, and it was a step and shoot where you said, hold your breath or don't move, and you took a picture because the tube could only move 180 degrees, then the, the table had to move, then it come back 180 degrees. Well, that slip ring technology from radar come right into CT. And so they, they put that gas in between the stationary part that the tubes had to be connected to and then the part that went around and around and, you, and helical CT was born. So you have a, a, a table that moves constantly and you get three planes instead of two and you know and then the other one is uh, that come directly from the Navy and, and, and uh, sonar and, and that was ultrasound when they started out testing ultrasound they put people in in stock tanks with all of these sonar probes or ultrasound probes all the way around that and then they found out that well you could use a little thing like mineral oil and put the transducer right on the body and, and get better images and mineral oil was messy so then they come up with ultrasound gel and 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 you know ultrasound and CT and MRIs just bloomed because of things like that so there's a lot of things that 
people don't realize that they get from the technology that the military developed first and then somebody said hey we can use this out in the civilian world too and education military and education is is a big deal it, it's a real big deal and you know any employer that wouldn't hire a veteran is an idiot uh, because you know they can they can say all they want to about well everything's rigid but it's not all rigid you know uh, the Marine Corps kind of had a saying that you have to adapt improvise and overcome and uh, that's not just in war that's in life so